You know, I spent um, about half a decade, a little more than half a decade, living in China as an expat back in the 90s, working for Procter & Gamble. Uh, I've led congressional delegation trips uh, to China while I've been serving here in Washington, D.C. I've had the opportunity to travel across the country. In fact, in 2016, when I left, led the congressional delegation, of senators and members of the House, uh, we went to Urumqi. We got to see the prominent Uyghur Muslim population as well. Uh, last year, we were in Tibet, and we got to uh, see firsthand uh, the Buddhist monks, and importantly, how they've been preserving the culture and uh, their religious heritage there. It's allowed me to see firsthand the human rights abuses and challenges the Chinese people face and the positive impact that an American presence can have in that country. In fact, our two youngest children, we have four children, our two youngest were born in Hong Kong uh, back in the 90s. And so I really see uh, Asia as really part of, uh, of my experiences. And, um, and when I think about China and talk about it, it's not in some theoretical construct. It's something that we have lived and breathed, whether living there or with subsequent visits. These travels have provided me the opportunity to raise critical issues impacting Tibet related to human rights, religious freedom, having access in Tibet, face-to-face -face dialogue with Chinese officials and leadership. In fact, just yesterday, yesterday afternoon, I had the opportunity to raise many of these issues directly with Ambassador Shui. He came to my office and we had a, a good conversation. And while much work needs to be done, it's essential that individual members of Congress and the U.S. government as a whole continue to press China on addressing and reversing course on their ongoing human rights and religious freedom abuses. Question for uh, Dr. Dorji, in your testimony, you focus significantly on the detention of prisoners of conscience. How can members of Congress and the public at large best assist efforts to secure the release of prisoners or advocate on their behalf where they are detained in Tibet or elsewhere in China? Thank you, Senator Dens, uh, for this opportunity to respond to your questions. Um, uh, as uh, commissioner on the use of, uh, we have a prisoner some conscience project, and uh, so that uh, tells you how much importance we give uh, to uh, you know, f uh, freeing uh, the prisoners of conscience. Uh, and what members of Congress could do, as at any given opportunity, uh, if you could raise uh, uh, not only uh, the individual cases of the prisoners of conscience, but also the policies and laws that have led uh, to uh, that. Uh, so that would be very helpful. And to my understanding, uh, that uh, when you use your bully pulpit uh, uh, to advocate uh, for uh, the prisoners of conscience, that makes a difference. Of course, uh, China is not going to let every prisoner of conscience to be free, but that means that uh, when we keep putting pressure out on them, uh, at least that makes a difference uh, in their lives. Might, maybe they might get a little uh, breather uh, through such influence. Uh, and also, members of Congress could adopt prisoners of conscience, and especially you know, in your case, when you uh, visit China and in your meeting with high officials, if you could uh, raise the issues, uh, uh, that would also make a big difference. Um, Dr. Green and Dr. George just mentioned about making a difference. I have fond memories of our time when we were expats living in Guangzhou. Uh, we were able to see how the treatment of children in orphanages was improved because of the presence and interaction of Americans We'd go there and visit on Saturdays. We would, we would hold these babies that oftentimes weren't receiving this human touch. And we noticed there was a, a built-in almost accountability that the orphanage started getting cleaner and uh, the care of, of these children uh, improved because we were showing up on Saturdays uh, to directly take care of these children and literally is to hold them. Uh, I believe this principle can be applied more broadly as well. I've called on Secretary Tillerson and this administration to appoint the special coordinator for Tibet. I think that's an important step. If there was a more substantial U.S. presence in Tibet, such as a U.S. embassy, a consulate, a special coordinator, what potential impacts would there be regarding the issues of religious freedom and human right causes in Tibet? The Question is an excellent, excellent one, uh, Senator. Thank you. I lived in Asia about six years, the same time frame, and have, in my case, I was in Japan. Have similar, similar fond memories. Traveled extensively throughout China. Um, the 
crackdown you've heard about is happening as transparency is being closed. It's not just uh, journalists or uh, diplomats, it's scholars, American scholars of Tibet who are being denied access. If we had a consulate uh, in Lhasa, if we had a presence there, it would do a number of things. It would allow academic exchanges because that's part of what our consulates do. <clears throat> um, it would allow um, officers from the U.S. State Department to uh, monitor the cases of individual uh, political detainees, to monitor trials. Um, it would allow them to provide accurate reporting of what's happening to the Tibetan people. And as I was mentioning in my testimony, uh, with respect to uh, a massive infrastructure uh, program and military program in the Himalayan plateau that is destabilizing, that is fundamentally raising tensions. It's, it's, a, it's an area we need presence and access, not just because of the Tibetan people's aspirations, but because of the, the negatively spiraling geopolitics between China and India. So in light of that, Dr. Green, what role do you think human rights would play within U.S. policy towards China as it relates to the broader issues of national security as well as these economic tensions? So I... Um, come at this as a historian and a scholar, but also for five years I was the special assistant and senior director for Asia on President George W. Bush's NSC staff. <clears throat> and in 2007, President Bush told Hu Jintao, <clears throat> with whom he had a good relationship, he said, I have good news and bad news, which do you want first? And Hu Jintao never been asked a question that way. He said, I'll take the good news. And President Bush said, I'm going to go to the Olympics. And then President Hu tried to end the meeting without the bad news. Uh, and the president said, wait, wait, you have to have the other part. I'm going to meet with His Holiness in the Congress and present him with the Congressional Gold Medal. It is possible to be uh, clear and consistent on human rights and democracy and have a productive relationship with Chinese counterparts. The key is to be consistent. It was in that same time frame that um, I was uh, uh, able to meet with Dai Bingguo, the state counselor. Um, it was before the Olympics. The Chinese were very worried about their image. They were worried about our election. And they supported, the government supported this dialogue I mentioned on Tibet, mostly scholars, but with some uh, participation from government. It was quite productive. When the Olympics ended, when our election happened, they dropped it. So I think it is possible to have a clear voice on human rights. I think it's possible to have a dialogue with China on these issues. Um, but we're going to have to find ways to leverage um, our relationship with China to push them, frankly, to come to the table. So, so in that regard, you, you highlight that is readily apparent that China has moved away with this dialogue, uh, from dialogue with the Dalai Lama. What are the prospects for re-engagement, in your opinion, between the PRC and Dalai Lama, and are the ways the U.S. could be productive towards that end? Um, it is harder now uh, than it was in 2007 and 8. Um, I think part of that is because of the financial crisis which I think gave leaders in Beijing an uh, overinflated sense of their own um, uh, power and leverage. Uh, Xi Jinping has a different approach to all these issues. Um, civil society space is closing in China, uh, including for U.S. companies, as you know. So it's a much harder operating environment. And the Chinese side has passed legislation, as you know, uh, declaring they'll decide who the successor to the Dalai Lama will, will be. So in diplomacy, when you put that many obstacles, it's hard to restart. But I think it is possible. Number one, President Trump, members of Congress as well, but President Trump should clearly call um, on Xi Jinping in his meetings, even if it's done privately, to resume this dialogue. Right. Number two, we should be funding and supporting uh, the coordinator for Tibet. Um, we should be reaching out as part of our diplomacy, not just with China, but with Europe, with Japan, with Australia, Korea, and India, uh, to support this as well. All right, I, I'm, uh, I'm in the extra innings right now. I'm, just to wrap up, I had one last question for Dr. Dorji. Uh, in your testimony, you mentioned the, and thank you, by the way, um, Mr. Green, uh, you mentioned in your testimony the European Parliament passed a resolution earlier last month in support of human rights activists in China and called for the immediate and unconditional release of targeted prisoners of conscience. What has been the reaction from the Chinese government on this resolution? Um, I don't know any uh, express reactions uh, by the Chinese uh, to this yet, uh, uh, but we can all uh, guess that they're not really happy at all when we try to put pressure on them. Uh, but if you allow me, I'll just go back to the previous question you asked. Uh, and one of the things uh, I think many members of the Congress that we try to do is, uh, you know, we should have uh, our embassy in Tibet, and that would really make a big difference, our physical presence in Tibet, right? And that would also 
you know, because uh, according to Tibetan Policy Act of 2002, our ambassador has to engage uh, uh, with the human rights uh, leaders, activists, and in my case, uh, Benjamin Lama, a person's conscience is very important. I don't know anything about him, but if we do have a presence there, our ambassador could at least find out uh, reliable information about his uh, well-being. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that gets back to like, close economy. E engagement generally produces better outcomes. Definitely. And, and on the ground presence. We've seen that over and over again. And uh, that's why I support moving in that direction, certainly, of an embassy or council up there in, uh, in, uh, in Tibet. So thank you.